So maybe I can uh, ask people to uh, take a seat. Um, this is um, a special Grand Rounds, and it's one that uh, I certainly uh, very much look forward to because it's uh, one of our few Grand Round experiences that we dedicate to the memory of a particular individual. Uh, and today, of course, we're uh, very delighted to reflect a tiny bit on Alex Spence. Alex Spence was uh, a neurologist uh, who uh, spent uh, almost uh, his entire career here at the University of Washington. His area of special expertise was neuro-oncology. He was extremely well suited for uh, dealing with patients uh, with brain tumors and uh, other kinds of cancers that affected uh, the central nervous system. Uh, he was a very astute clinician. He was versed in neuropathology, which is a very important component of that work. Uh, and most especially, he was extremely compassionate. Uh, he made deep connections with his patients. He made deep connections with all of us and with the residents. Uh, so I'm uh, especially delighted to see members of his family here. Marie, Evelyn, and Douglas, welcome. Uh, and uh, you guys should come to Grand Rounds more often. I kind of miss you. So um, uh, please, uh, uh, many of you uh, in the audience know a lot about Alex. I, I have no intention of going back over all of that uh, uh, material, uh, but uh, I do really want to emphasize that Alex is someone who left a very lasting mark uh, on the Department of Neurology. He made enormous contributions. He really developed a tradition of neuro-oncology here at the University of Washington. Uh, and so, uh, Alex, if you're listening to me, uh, uh, we're just incredibly happy to do this, uh, uh, to bring back your memory. By the way, Alex hated things like this. <laughs> I just want to say for clarity, uh, he was very much uh, uh, allergic to uh, drawing a lot of attention to himself. But Alex, there's nothing you can do about it. So, um, we're going to have an introduction of our speaker today by Machi Mugala. Machi, can I ask you to come up? Thank you, Bruce, for uh, speaking about Alex. Uh, we are very uh, lucky today to have uh, Dr. Tracy Batchel from Boston, uh, who came all the way um, uh, to uh, give the third annual memorial lecture dedicated to um, Alex uh, Spence. Uh, Dr. Batchelor uh, is also dear to me. He trained me in new oncology. Uh, already 10 years ago, um, and I, am, I will be eternally grateful for that. For that. Uh, Dr. Batchelor received um, his undergraduate medical degrees from Emory University as well as Harvard University. Uh, he completed training in internal medicine at uh, Yale, and then went on to a neurology residency at MGH, uh, where he was a chief resident. Uh, he then joined staff at the Massachusetts General Hospital um, and has been uh, the director of the Neurology Fellowship uh, between 96 and 2006. And then he served as the executive director of the Catherine Pappas uh, Center for Neuro-Oncology uh, and the chief of division of Neuro-Oncology at Mass General ever since. Um, Dr. Batchelor is uh, very accomplished uh, in the field of neuro-oncology. Um, uh, his specific interests include uh, glioma, but also uh, lymphoma. Um, he will teach us today about uh, targeted therapies for brain tumors. And just one other interesting fact uh, about Dr. Batchelor and our institution, we have sent three residents from our program to Boston, uh, Christine Lou Emerson and Ina Lee just uh, recently, and Tara Bankers, who is uh, here in the audience, and they were all trained uh, in oncology, also by Dr. Bachelor. So there's a, a very nice legacy uh, from Seattle to Boston and back, hopefully. So Dr. Bachelor, uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, the stage is yours. Well, thank you. Oh, let me turn my microphone on. Thank you for the kind introduction, and most importantly, thank you for the honor of uh, giving this third annual lecture in memory of Alex. I, I knew Alex. Uh, I was commenting to his family out there well, uh, before the lecture that the last time I was in Seattle, seven years or so ago, I, uh, Alex took me to dinner with two of the residents uh, in the department, and it was a very memorable event. I still remember 
going to the restaurant, and we sat in the middle of the restaurant, and it was pouring down rain, and they had the windows open, but we were sitting in the middle, so we were nice and toasty and warm and dry, and we could enjoy the sound of the rain, and we had a wonderful meal together. So I have very fond memories of Alex. And thank you, Machi, for introducing me, and thank you, UW, for sending us great residents uh, to train as fellows, and uh, uh, we're you know, keep it up. We, we like the pipeline. We want to keep it going. So um, I'm going to talk today uh, about targeted therapies. And I'm going to cover not only gliomas, I'm going to talk about several different types of primary brain tumors. And I'm also going to end up talking a little bit about brain metastases at the very end. So without further ado, so we are truly in the era of precision oncology. So there are a number of different types of uh, cancers where important genetic alterations, driver alterations, oncogenic mutations have been discovered. They can be measured in clinical samples. Clinical trials have been done to target these mutations. And there have been great successes across leukemia, breast cancer, lung cancer, and others. Uh, all these are examples, there are many others, of treatments that have come uh, to FDA approval as targeted therapies for these various different types of uh, solid tumors and hematologic malignancies. We're clearly lagging behind in neuro-oncology, but I was just telling Mark Chamberlain out there, and he, he, he knows this, we have one approved targeted therapy in neuro-oncology, and that's Averolimus. And that's for this condition known as subependable giant cell astrocytoma, which occurs within the context of uh, tuberous sclerosis, which all of you know well. It's an autosomal dominant genetic disorder. Uh, Intor signaling gets turned on, activated when these uh, mutations occur in the TSC1 or TSC2 um, genes. Iberolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. And there was a paper about six years ago in the New England Journal which led to the FDA approval of Iberolimus for subependable giant cell astrocytoma based on a study of 26 patients, extremely rare condition. But this was another paper that came out just last year, a five-year follow-up of these cases now. And the primary endpoint here was the volume of the tumor. So reduction in size is what they were looking for. And the outcomes were that over 50% of the 23 patients had reductions in size of these tumors by 50%. And you can see at five years, you can see here some of the examples in this trial of the tumors actually beginning uh, shrinking over time. And here we are out six, seven years and there's still reduction in size of these tumors. So these are, these are durable responses, but these patients also require continuous treatment with a virulimus uh, uh, targeting this uh, mTOR pathway. So we do have one example of a targeted therapy uh, for a specific mutation in a type of brain tumor uh, that is approved by the FDA. Of course, this is a tiny number of patients who have this, um, and we're hoping that we'll will replicate this success uh, in the future with other types of uh, primary brain tumors. And the, the, the most formidable opponent that we all face, I think, in neuro-oncology is glioblastoma. So I want to say a few words about um, genetic alterations in glioblastoma and targeted therapy trials in glioblastoma. We have an entire research program, a SPORE research grant that's focused on targeted therapies in gliomas. These are our projects in this. I'm not going to cover all of these, but we have projects targeting signal transduction in endothelial cells in glioblastoma. We have a project targeting PI3 kinase signaling, IDH signaling, I am going to talk about this one, or even signaling in BRAF uh, in pediatric astrocytoma. So we have a, uh, a large effort and have invested a lot of uh, resources in targeted therapies on in gliomas. So, Back really in the 1980s, certainly in the 1990s, we began to better understand, if you will, the genetic anatomy of gliomas. What are the mutations that occur in this disease? What are, which of these mutations are true drivers of the disease? And these are some of the alterations that have been discovered through a lot of biology over time. So there are a number of receptors on the cell that are mutated, like epidermal growth factor receptor, or amplified, extra copies of the gene. Downstream from the receptors, some of these other nodes lower down in the signal transduction pathway, there are mutations that have been discovered in PI3 kinase, P10, or deletions of P10, and all of these alterations have the potential to drive cell proliferation in glioblastoma. 
So they're all worthy of investigation as possible targets for therapy in glioma. So we've discovered a number of these targets over time, but now you also have to be able to measure these mutations in the clinic. It's not as simple as it sounds to develop assays that are reliable, that can be done at multiple institutions, and that are CLIA approved for use in clinical trials. Because you have to have CLIA approved tests in order to use these assays to enroll patients in, in clinical trials. This is what we do at, at MGH uh, on our gliomas. So we have a, a, a validated, a CLIA certified, relatively cheap genotyping assay called Snapshot. I'll come back to this. Uh, this started really about six years ago. We started using this in the neuro-oncology uh, clinic and neuropathology. We also perform FISH analysis to look for a number of gene amplification events. Again, these are potential targets of therapy. And we also recently added a solid uh, tumor fusion assay uh, that uh, looks at a number of alterations that are quite rare in glioblastoma, but do occur in glioblastoma. And again, these could be, this one in particular, probably is an oncogenic driver in glioblastoma, small subset of glioblastoma. This is snapshot. So this is, this is, uh, was developed really not with glioblastoma in mind. This was developed for the entire cancer center. So the genes that were selected uh, for this panel are genes that are known to be oncogenic drivers, and their mutation, that these gene mutations have drugs that target them. This is how the panel was, was selected. Many of these, though, are highly relevant for glioblastoma, like EGFR I mentioned earlier, PI3 kinase, P10, etc. So this is these are known hotspots in genes. So it's, a, it's an assay looking at known mutational hotspots in oncogenic genes. That's snapshot. Now, if you apply snapshot, this was the first 200 cases that we looked at in, at NGH. You can see that these are the different mutations here, and they're represented across different types of gliomas. These are low-grade gliomas out here. As we move across, these are higher grade. You get to the grade four of the glioblastoma. You can see, even with hotspot analysis, these are more complex tumors, glioblastomas, right? There are many more different types of mutations that are occurring in glioblastoma than that are occurring in grade two oligoastrocytoma, which are basically just a, I, consist of IDH1 mutations and P53 mutations. So the genetic complexity definitely goes along with the grade of the tumor. This is the next generation platform that we'll be moving to from Snapshot. We've been told we're going to be moving to this for the last year and a half. We've yet to move to it yet, but apparently uh, we, we will at some point. So now we're going to go from 24 genes up to about 800 genes. We're going to have whole exon coverage across these genes, and we're told that the turnaround time is going to be reasonable for clinical decision making, and that the cost is not going to be prohibitive, but we shall see what ultimately ends up coming our way. But this is where we're, not only us, but all of the place, all of the institutions are really headed for more comprehensive genomic surveys of tumors. Okay, so I showed you earlier this a similar diagram that had a number of genetic alterations in it, it had these different tumor types, and it had all these drugs out here uh, that work in these mutations. Those were FDA approved drugs in those cancers. We have, aside from Everolimus, we have no FDA approved target therapies yet in glioma or glioblastoma. But we are beginning to change the paradigm of our clinical trials. That is to say that we are now profiling your institution, my institution, all really academic institutions are profiling gliomas, and we're enrolling on clinical trials based on those molecular profiles. That's the paradigm that we're beginning, we're, in the, we're transitioning to in neuro-oncology. And these are some, again, some of the genetic alterations and some of the trials that are either have been completed or ongoing uh, in, with these uh, in, in, in glioblastoma. So I want to say a word about uh, a few of these pathways. So I want to start with the epidermal growth factor pathway. This is the most common genetic alteration in glioblastoma. So about 40% of glioblastomas will have amplification of this gene, extra gene copies of, of, of the gene in the tumor. And about half of those, so about 20% of glioblastomas, will have a mutation in the EGFR V3 component, uh, EGFR V3 gene. Uh, so these are the first generation trials. Uh, these are, this is gefitinib and erlotinib. These are reversible uh, EGFR inhibitors. And these were the first drugs that were tried in glioblastoma. And as you can see here, this is a, the metric we use, this is, this is recurrent glioblastoma. 
And one of the common metrics we use to look for a signal, to look for activity, is the percentage of patients who are progression-free at six months, PFS6. And what I can tell you is with standard chemotherapy, alkylating chemotherapy, you can get about a 20 to 25 percent PFS6. So if you look at the PFS6 with these targeted drugs, the EGFR inhibitors, they're not that good, right? All of them are under really under under 25 percent, under 20 percent, except for this one outlier. So despite the implication of this pathway in glioblastoma, the first generation EGFR inhibitors uh, really failed in the clinic. And one of the questions is why? So there are several possibilities, right? One is that this is just not an important driver in glioblastoma. Uh, that's a, a possibility. We hope that's not true. Another possibility is that these first-generation drugs are just not good brain drugs. They're not that good in terms of getting into the brain. And they're reversible inhibitors, so they're not as potent as the newer generation PGFR inhibitors. The other thing that was not done in these trials is these were not genetically selected trials. In other words, these were all comers with recurrent glioblastoma just got enrolled in the trials. And only afterwards in some of them did they go back and ask the question, well, was the EGFR gene mutated or amplified in these tumor specimens? So that's not the way we, we really should be, should, should be doing these trials. And even in the cases where they went back in time and they looked at the tumor specimens to say, is EGFR uh, turned on or not, they were looking at the original tumor specimen, the archival tumor specimen not the specimen at the time of recurrence. That's a big difference, and that's another flaw in these trials. Uh, in order to do them right, we really should be looking at the tumor tissue <coughs> at the time of recurrence to see if the gene is still really relevant. I'm going to show you something in just a minute that speaks to this. So we launched this trial, and I think we improved uh, somewhat uh, in terms of an EGFR inhibitor trial. Uh, this is an irreversible inhibitor. It has shown activity in non-small cell lung cancer and where reversible inhibitors have failed or don't work. So it's a more potent drug. It is an excellent CNS penetrating drug. Uh, and in this trial in recurrent glioblastoma, we required in order for you to be treated, you had to have an EGFR genetic event, a mutation or an amplification. But we were still hamstrung because we still had to use the original archival tissue. We didn't, we didn't require tissue at the time of recurrence. And we can talk about that at the time of the in the, in the questions of, about why that, why that is and why that was. In any event, we enrolled 56 patients in this trial. We had three different arms. I won't bore you with all the details. And what I can tell you is we just completed this trial uh, within the last few months. And what I can tell you is that we had only a handful of responses. This is an example of one. This was a patient who had, was in the surgical arm. So we had this part of the tumor actually resected, uh, then went back on the drug. And then this is, the two, this is some residual deeper tumor. And you can see that later that actually looks like that there is some response of that uh, residual tumor there. So we had a handful of these responses, uh, three or four, but we really, again, weren't, uh, weren't seeing the types of responses that they've seen with these drugs in non-small cell lung cancer. And again, it raises the question of why, and I alluded to this earlier, is maybe an EGFR amplification mutation in the original tumor tissue is not still relevant at the time of recurrence. Maybe it's not even present at the time of recurrence, right? So the way that we've addressed this is, uh, uh, and we, I'll show you a, a slide in just a moment, uh, but we, I have to, I have to uh, say that we started an autopsy research program uh, in, in neuro-oncology. Uh, when we started this program about three years ago, three or four years ago, we had not performed an autopsy on a patient with glioblastoma in probably more than a decade. And then we had a trial where we were seeing some patients who were responding to an anti-angiogenesis drug. We were trying to understand these responses, and we thought it would be useful to look at some of the tissue after treatment. And we began to ask our patients again about whether they would be willing to donate their brain for research. It's amazing when we did this, because they all said yes. And to this day, very few when we asked declined, because it, the remarkable thing about these patients, as many of you, of you know, because it's such a difficult disease, they don't have many options. They want to try to help. They want to try to give back. So we've now uh, had almost 100 patients enrolled in this brain donation program. We have 76 glioblastomas. They consent to the full spectrum of molecular testing, including whole genome sequencing. We collect blood on all of them. We even have a few where we've done full autopsies, including a handful of cases where we have metastatic glioblastoma, a very rare condition. 
and we're expanding this now to brain metastasis. But this is the re this is the resource that led to this uh, this data, and I'm actually going to present this in Japan uh, next week. This is one slide of a of, um, of a presentation on our autopsy program. But basically, what you have here in the top slide here is a is a glioblastoma surgical resection in this patient, and what we're looking at are copy numbers of the EGFR gene. And you can see here the in this one tumor specimen, there are tons of extra copies of the EGFR gene at the time of the original diagnosis and the original surgery. All right? So the patient goes on to have standard of care and unfortunately does not do well and passes away. We look at the autopsy specimen. If you look where there should be the, all these extra EGFR gene copies, there aren't any. So here's an example of a tumor that has a genetic evolution over time where that arch archival original specimen gets you into trouble because that original alteration is not relevant later on after, after a time has passed. But what is, what is also interesting about this case is that there is another oncogene that was not turned on initially that is highly amplified uh, in, this, in, in this autopsy specimen, and that's CMET. So CMET is another oncogene that's well described. Uh, it's a rare event in glioblastoma. It's the kind of the purple lavender color here. It's about 5 to 10% of glioblastomas will have amplification of the CMET oncogene. So it turns out that there are inhibitors of uh, CMET. So this was a patient uh, of mine who had a recurrent glioblastoma, and this was after being treated on a, a trial of an anti-VEGF drug. And as neuro-oncologists in the room and maybe others will know, after a tumor, a glioblastoma fails treatment on an anti-VEGF drug, they really don't usually respond to anything else, and they usually rapidly progress. So this patient had failed an anti-VEGF drug. We tested the tumor tissue. Uh, in this case, all the little purple dots are extra copies of the cement gene. This is fish, showing that this is highly amplified in this, in this patient, this tumor. And we treated the patient with this MET, or ALK inhibitor, called prazotinib, and this was a phase one trial for uh, all solid tumors. It wasn't specific to glioblastoma. The trial simply required that you had to have either a MET amplification or an ALK mutation because this drug targets that pathway. So this patient had a MET amplification. We treated, it on, treated her on this phase one trial, and you can see that there's a, a, a significant response. No steroids involved here. So this is almost a 50% reduction, but not quite. So we couldn't quite count it as a partial response, but I think you can appreciate that there is some response here, and you can see even the surrounding edema and flare has come down. Uh, after treatment with this drug. Now, this was not durable in the sense that about four months later, this tumor started to grow again, but I do think it's proof of principle that a drug like prazotinib in a med-amplified uh, patient might be worth looking at. In fact, this is screaming out to do a clinical trial, and we've had nothing but frustration trying to get companies interested in uh, patients with med-amplified glioblastoma. So it's 5% of a rare disease, so they're not that interested. Uh, so we, we remain uh, on the lookout for a, a CMET inhibitor uh, for glioblastoma. The last alteration or pathway I want to mention for glioblastoma is uh, IDH1. So IDH1, isocitrate dehydrogenase, uh, is green. And you can see that in glioblastoma, about 10% of patients will have an IDH1 mutation. As you go down in grade, so low grades have a higher frequency of IDH1 mutations, and this is well known. Now this is a, uh, an interesting mutation. It's a gain-of-function mutation. Normally what happens with a wild-type IDH1 is it converts isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, but with the mutant type, it, it's a, there's a gain-of-function where it actually converts alpha-ketoglutarate to 2-hydroxyglutarate. Uh, These are obviously metabolic pathway genes. 2-hydroxyglutarate is, is known, uh, therefore, as an oncometabolite. It only accumulates with this mutation is present. The nice thing about this mutation is you don't need snapshot to determine who has it. You can use immunohistochemistry. So here's immunohistochemistry in these brown cells or tumor cells that have IDH1 mutations. So uh, just a few comments about this. Um, this is getting a lot of attention uh, in gliomas. So these mutations are found in, a, in about 70% of all low-grade gliomas, uh, less frequent, again, in high-grade gliomas. I mentioned that this mutation causes accumulation of this oncometabolite, 2-hydroxyglutarate. The accumulations are substantial. 
they're up to 1,000 fold elevated in cells. And because they're so, the 2-HG levels are so high in the cells, you can actually detect it using MR spectroscopy. So this was work that our team did, and we published this around the same time the UCSF group published the same uh, observation, that by using MR, uh, brain MR spectroscopy, that you can actually detect 2-hydroxyglutarate in the brain. So here is a patient with an IDH-mutated anaplastic astrocytoma. You put the voxel over the tumor. And based on where 2-HG should fall in the spectra, you see a, a, a signal. So there's 2-HG in this IDH1 mutated tumor. Here's a wild-type tumor. You look where it should be, it's not there. Here's a normal control. You look where it should be, it's not there. So this is a really a non-invasive measure that can potentially define who has an IDH1 mutation and who does not. Moreover, it might be a biomarker that we can follow over time as we treat these patients with inhibitors of this pathway. The other thing that's very important, of course, is that this pathway, an enzyme, is druggable. And the drugs that uh, are, are available right now, the IDH1, first generation IDH1 inhibitors, uh, definitely suppress the growth of IDH mutant leukemias. And this was work that was done by Bill Kalin at Dana Farber, published in Science years ago. Bill leads our IDH1 project on our spore, where he showed that the uh, oncometabolite 2 hydroxyglutarate is sufficient. Uh, to promote leukemogenesis and that it's reversible. When you remove 2-HG, the leukemogenic effects reverse. And these drugs are actually working well in uh, uh, AML. However, they do not appear to be working that well, at least anecdotally, in gliomas. We don't have formal reports from these first-generation studies of IDH1 inhibitors, but we've all seen some of this, uh, these cases, these data, and they're not working like they're working in leukemias. Let's put it that way. So why is that? Because even in culture, when you build, or not culture, when you build these mouse models of these IDH1 tumors, the drugs definitely hit the target. They definitely drop the 2-HG levels, but the glioma cells continue to grow. So it may not, it, it, it is not going to be a simple story in glioma. And our approach has been to look at synthetic lethal approaches to IDH1 mutations. We have two basic, approach, two basic strategies. I can tell you about one since it, had, it was published in December. And uh, this was really work done by Andrew Chi when he was at, at MGH and Dan Cahill. And they demonstrated that IDH1 mutant cancer cell lines are extremely sensitive to depletion of NAD uh, in the cell. Mutant IDH1 decreases NAD levels, intracellular NAD levels, by inhibiting a, a pathway or an enzyme that, that converts NADH to NAD, this so-called NAPRT uh, enzyme. So, Mutant IDH1 inhibits this enzyme. Therefore, mutant IDH1 tumor cells are completely dependent on a salvage pathway to generate NAD for the cell in order for the cell to function, proliferate, divide, etc. This is the NAPT salvage pathway, and there are NAPT inhibitors that are out there. So this might be a way to deplete the tumor cell, IDH mutant tumor cells of NAD, by blocking NAPT. And when you block NAPT in these cells, the NAD is depleted, the cells uh, uh, undergo autophagy, and many of them die. So when we looked at this in uh, cell lines here, you can see that the mutant IDH1, these are glioma cell lines, are all very sensitive to NAPT inhibitors. So again, uh, the uh, mutant wild-type cell lines, on the other hand, do not respond to, to uh, NAPT inhibitors. And so, again, so if in an IDH1 mutant situation, this pathway is turned off by the mutation, rendering the cell completely dependent on this pathway. And if you use a NAPT inhibitor, you can deplete the cell of NAD. So here's a murine model uh, showing this. So here's uh, an IDH mutant uh, 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 orthotopic mouse model of glioblastoma. And you treat the, the animal with this inhibitor of NAPT, and you see a prolongation of survival. This may not look like a lot, but it's statistically significant and highly relevant for this particular model. So these drugs work in the mice. They work in the cell lines. We don't know if they're going to work in humans. And one of the challenges we face with NAPT inhibitors is that there is on-target toxicity that is going to be difficult to deal with, and it's retinal toxicity. So a lot of the, comp a lot of the early studies of these drugs were terminated because these patients develop retinal toxicity. Not all. And there might be some ways around that or, or, or preventing retinal toxicity. So we're still trying to see if we can move NAMT inhibitors uh, into early phase clinical trials of, uh, 
IDH1 mutant gliomas. Okay, that's glioma. So I'm going to switch gears now, and I'm going to talk about another tumor, meningiomas. So this is uh, probably well known to all of you. Here you can see this large dural mass that's not only compressing the brain, but has eroded through the bone in this case, and has grown through the bone, and is actually right up under the scalp. So <clears throat> we always think about meningioma as being a surgical disease, and in most cases it certainly is. But there are certainly bad types of meningiomas, and there are bad locations of meningiomas. So we still should be looking for alternative treatments for men meningiomas. Meningiomas also are the most common primary brain tumor, 30% of all primary brain tumors. So uh, it's a, a, a very common problem in neuro-oncology. We know somewhat some things about the molecular genetics of meningiomas. So it turns out that uh, the NF2 gene is either mutated or there's chromosomal loss of it in anywhere from 40 to 70% of meningiomas. But we don't, don't know or didn't know much beyond that about the molecular genetics of meningiomas. And importantly, until recently, there were really no treatments that could target these NF2 mutations in meningiomas. And that, that has changed, and I'll come back to that. So my colleague uh, at NGH and her, and her colleagues at uh, the Broad uh, Institute, Priscilla Brastiano, she really is a, uh, drove this work, uh, looked at genomic sequencing of meningiomas to better understand the genetic <coughs> landscape of these tumors beyond the, the NF2 mutations we already know about. And they made several interesting observations. This was whole exome genome sequencing in 17 grade 1 meningiomas. That was the experimental set. And then they did a validation set after uh, making some observations here in a larger group of about 50 meningiomas. And the observations they made that at about 10% of NF2 wild-type meningiomas have mutations, oncogenic, well-described mutations in the AKT uh, gene. And this mutation is well known to activate the PI3 kinase pathway. They also had one patient who had a mutation mTOR. You remember the story I told you about the SIGAs earlier, the mTOR pathway, where well, there was one patient who had an mTOR mutation. And about 5% of the patients, again, NF2 wild type patients, had mu mutations in, this, in the smoothen gene. And this activates the sonic hedgehog pathway and cell proliferation and division this way. So these were new observations, and the, the group at Yale about the same time came out with these same two genes, essentially, AKT1 and smooth, and is being altered in roughly about 15 to 20 percent of NF2 wild type meningiomas. And the interesting thing about that is that these are targetable. So both of these genes are known oncogenic drivers, and both of these mutations have inhibitors that were developed for them. So, uh, and the other interesting thing about this is that they were these mutations appear to be related to the location of the meningioma. So this was a paper from the Yale group, and they had a larger data set. They had 38 AKT mutations they discovered in this data set. 26 out of these 38 were in skull-based meningiomas. And even the smoothened mutations, where there are 11, 7 out of 11 smoothened mutations were also in the skull base. And I personally think this is important because skull-based meningiomas are some of the most difficult to deal with in terms of symptoms and in terms of resection. So if there are drugs that could potentially uh, target these mutations at work, these, this would be a, a significant step forward. So what she has done now is developed a clinical trial uh, in meningiomas of targeted therapy. There are three arms in this trial. So there's an arm for these patients who have smoothened mutations. They'll receive the smoothened inhibitor vismotigib. This drug is actually approved for uh, patients with basal cell carcinoma. Patients who have AKT mutations will be treated with an AKT inhibitor. This drug is not yet approved, but it's under study in multiple malignancies. And now there's some evidence that FAC inhibition might be an effective treatment for NF2 mutated tumors. So there's an arm even for uh, patients who have the NF2 mutation. So this trial is run through the Alliance Cooperative Group. It's been activated. We're now screening. We're the screening site at our institution. We're screening a, a ton of meningiomas. And the first, I think, five patients that have enrolled, I think there's a total of five, have all been treated by, with the uh, FAC inhibitor. So we haven't had anyone enroll yet in the AKT or the smoothened arms, but that will certainly happen as we begin to pick up some of these mutations. So that's the meningioma story in terms of uh, targeted therapy that's under development and under study. So now I'm going to switch and talk about craniopharyngioma. So we talked about the most common primary brain tumor, which is meningioma. 
And now I'm going to talk about an extremely rare type of tumor, uh, craniopharyngiomas. There are less than 500 diagnosed each year in the United States. They can be difficult because they tend, if they're not completely removed, they, they tend to recur. And they can also have their capsule disrupted and it can disseminate even at the time of surgery. So these can be bad actors. Uh, so Priscilla uh, took the same approach here. There was really not much known about the genomic landscape of uh, craniopharyngiomas. So she launched uh, this study with her colleagues uh, at Dana Farber and GH in the Broad. And as you know, uh, craniopharyngiomas come in two flavors, adamantinomatous and papillary. And they observed mutually exclusive genetic mutations in these two subtypes of, of craniopharyngioma. In the adamantinomatous type, 95% of these uh, tumors had mutations in the beta catenin pathway. In the papillary craniopharyngioma type, 95% of the tumors had mutations in the BRAF, in, in the BRAF gene. These are the canonical V600E mutations that are also reported uh, in melanoma uh, and in where, where these drugs have been approved, BRAF inhibitors uh, in melanoma. So uh, we also had the occasion to encounter this patient at around the time these data came out of a person who had had multiple emergent tumor decompressions, four operations within one year because the tumor kept growing back. This is one of the last times they're classically uh, hypodense on CT, but you can see the contrast enhancing tumor here on the MRI. This is the tumor specimen. Immunohistochemistry also works to pick up this BRAF mutation. You can see the brown uh, stains here. This was a papillary craniopharyngioma that had a BRAF mutation. <clears throat> so. Uh, she took the plunge and put the patient on uh, dabrafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor. Uh, by day 17, there was already a, some slight reduction in the size of the tumor. Uh, one month later, there's an 85% reduction in the size of the tumor with dabrafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor. And also, this does reflect the addition of another kind of inhibitor called a MEK inhibitor. Uh, adding MEK inhibition to BRAF inhibition is shown to enhance the ability of BRAF uh, drugs to work and to reduce resistance to BRAF. So it makes a lot of sense to combine BRAF and MEK. And so you can see there's the MRI. Here's the plot of the tumor volume, the enhancing volume, the cystic volume. Here's when the trametinib was started, the MEK inhibitor. You can see there was already a significant <coughs> drop in the enhancing volume, but when you add the MEK inhibitor, there was even a further drop. Uh, in, the, in the tumor. This patient had residual tumor left <coughs> at about uh, one month and went back to the operating room to remove the residual tumor. Here's the pretreatment specimen, the post-treatment specimen, and you can see afterwards there is some viable tumor left here, but you see the influx or, uh, of all infiltration of all these foamy macrophages, fibrosis of uh, a specimen that looks like it's been treated uh, and it, uh, with, the, with something, in this case a BRAF inhibitor. Here is the pretreatment, post-treatment, KI67, the mitotic index, if you will. 20% before treatment, the cells left behind, or uh, the, the uh, KI67 is less than 1%. Here you see macrophages infiltrating uh, the treated tumor, and the number of CD8 cells also goes up in the treated tumor. So it's an N of 1, but there was another case uh, presented shortly after this one from the UK. Uh, showing also a similar response of a papillary craniopharyngioma to a BRAF MEK inhibitor. And so Priscilla's gone on now to develop this trial, which is a targeted therapy trial in papillary craniopharyngioma. Uh, these are uh, 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 going to have to have BRAF mutation demonstrated. Uh, they'll be treated with BRAF and MEK inhibitors for four months of treatment, and the primary endpoint will be the CNS response rate. Uh, this is now, this concept has been approved by NCI. Uh, we finally think we have a company that's willing to provide their BRAF and MEK inhibitors, so it looks like this, this trial will move forward. And I want to end on, cranio, uh, on brain metastases. So brain metastases are the most common tumor in the head. So meningiomas are the most common primary brain tumor. Brain metastases are the most common intracranial tumor, period. Uh, the estimates are not well known, but there are probably more than 150,000 case, new cases a year of brain metastases. Contrast that to glioblastoma, where there's maybe 12 to 15,000 cases a year. And these are you know, devastating complications. They occur in up to 25% of all cancer patients at some point. Uh, in the modern era, median survival is still measured in months. 
The incidence appears to be rising, at least for some subtypes, as our systemic treatments are improving. And fundamentally, we really have a limited understanding, specifically, of how the brain metastases evolve from the primary tumor. So this is my superstar faculty member again, Priscilla Bastianos, uh, who has done this work. Uh, this is a, a project where she looked at whole exome sequencing of over 100 brain metastases that had matched primary tumor. So their lung cancer or their kidney cancer, she had those specimens, she had the brain metastases, and she had uh, blood on these uh, patients. This was published in Cancer Discovery a few months ago. And the important point is really on this slide. So these are these uh, phy phylogenetic trees that they're, you, you now see in uh, uh, cancer genetics where you trace the evolution of mutations over time. So in this case, the, the, the gray bar or gray line represents mutations that are shared by the primary tumor, let's say a lung cancer, and the metastasis, a brain metastasis, all right? But then there's further mutational evolution in the primary tumor and further mutational evolution in the metastasis. This is so-called branched evolution in terms of how these mutations uh, evolve over time. So uh, what she did was, uh, I'll give you an example of um, uh, one of the cases. So the, one of the questions was, because when we think about brain metastases uh, and we think about targeted therapies, so targeted therapies work for a number of different types of primary cancers, melanoma, some types of non-small cell lung cancer, et cetera. So if you have a patient with melanoma who has uh, metastatic disease, let's say, in their lung or their liver, and they have brain metastases, and you want to use a BRAF inhibitor, are the brain metastases the same as what you have in the liver and what you have in the lung? Surprisingly, no one's ever really asked that question. So this is what this work is all about. So what she did was, this is an example. She had diff many different types of cancers. This is actually a salivary uh, duct carcinoma. And in this case, uh, there are a number of genetic events that are shared. Uh, by the brain metastasis in this case, the primary tumor, and the lung metastasis. All right? These are all mutations that are shared by all three. But each of these other uh, lines, so the lung metastasis ev evolves its own set of mutations, and the brain metastasis evolves its own set of mutations. And in fact, this mutation here, this MYC amplification, which is theoretically targetable, there are drugs that could target this, is not present in the original sample or in the metastasis. So if you're relying on a biopsy from the primary tumor or a metastasis somewhere else from the primary tumor, not the brain, it's not really, you're not really sampling the true genetic, the true genetic uh, constitution of the brain metastasis. That's point number one. The other point here, well, that's fine, but what if you have multiple brain metastases? And remember, when patients are diagnosed with brain metastasis, the majority of them will have multiple metastases, not a single metastasis. So does this still occur in the brain? So in other words, if you've got two or three different sites of brain metastasis, are these just different genetic tumors in different parts of the brain? So we have several uh, cases to examine this. So this was a patient who had a cerebellar metastasis uh, and a parietal lobe metastasis had the cerebellum metastasis and the parietal lobe metastasis resected. And you can see that here's the, again, here's the, here are all the brain metastases here. And so all of the brain metastases, the two brain metastases, shared the same, these same genetic events. There was some evolution. There was a slight degree of evolution in the different brain metastases, but they really did share these same kind of core truncal event, truncal genetic events. So that might speak to the fact that there's not as much evolution when the tumor begins to spread inside the brain. So maybe targeted approaches of a single pathway that you know is active in the brain might be useful in patients with brain metastases. So I know that that's a mouthful, so let me summarize that. So every metastasis in this study of 100 cases had branched evolution. Brain metastases harbor distinct, potentially actionable genetic alterations compared to the primary tumors. Different brain metastasis regions, cerebellum, parietal lobe, are relatively homogeneous. And extracranial metastases are really not a reliable surrogate for brain metastasis. So when we think about these trials, we need to know what the genetic events are in the brain metastasis. So this is also going to be a, C, uh, uh, this is a CTEP approved uh, concept, will be run likely in the Alliance uh, Consortium. 
So this will be the first biomarker-driven trial in brain metastases. So we'll have tissue from at least one brain metastasis. And there are different arms based on the different pathways that might be turned on, PI3 kinase inhibitors, MED inhibitors, CD inhibitors. CNS response rate is the primary endpoint. And I, I think this is the way we're going to see these trials evolve uh, moving forward. So we're going to require more tissue from our brain metastasis trials in order, uh, in order to enroll them on these targeted therapies. So that's, uh, that's the story, or the stories. I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, faculty at MGH. Uh, Priscilla did those last three stories were really all from Priscilla. She is truly a dynamo. Uh, and it's doing really fantastic work. The IDH uh, mutations really, uh, Dan Cahill, myself, and Andrew Chi. Andrew Chi has now moved on to NYU where he's running his own program there. All of our pathology colleagues, uh, uh, we have a number of excellent uh, scholars on our K-12 training grant who are working on these projects, our statistician, our bioinformaticians, who are essential for this type of work uh, with large-scale sequencing, and I want to acknowledge my NIH grants. Thank you very much. Any questions? Well, yes. Yeah, I know obviously the focus is on, on therapy, but I'm, I'm a pathologist. I'm curious about what the current state of the art is in understanding some aspect of pathogenesis. For example, in epidemiological studies. Uh, that might might uh, uh, put a finger on a particular subset of, uh, of carcinogens, for example. How many individuals might be heterozygous for tumor suppressor? Maybe the uncle gene might be the second step. Uh, constitutional heterozygosity, right. things like that. And early thinking about. Uh, trying to understand the early uh, pathogenesis. Sure. So the question was uh, from a pathologist. Uh, about the pathogenesis of these tumors and potential genetic or non-genetic epidemiological risk factors for, uh, for brain tumors. So there are different kinds of brain tumors I talked about sure. today. But I would say, I guess what we should say is glioblastoma, which is, which is the, uh, the most common malignant one. Uh, we really, uh, there are uh, tumor susceptibility syndromes, uh, which give you an increased risk of uh, glioblastoma, Lee-Fromani, Calvin syndrome. Uh, even NF, even neurofibromatosis. But in toto, those account for a tiny fraction of the glioblastomas that are diagnosed each year in the United States. So the genetic and uh, risk factors are largely unknown beyond that. And the non-genetic risk factors or environmental factors that have been looked at also, I would say, I'm not an epidemiologist, but there really is no smoking gun. Uh, and there's really very little known about risk, uh, environmental uh, risk factors for the development of glioblastoma. For meningioma, uh, since the time of Harvey Cushing, when he made his observation that, that individuals who seem to have repetitive head trauma seem to maybe be at risk of meningiomas, that might be a, a risk factor for meningiomas. Radiation is a risk factor. Prior radiation, therapeutic radiation, is a risk factor for meningiomas and probably for glioblastoma as well. Um, so, you know, there's... Um, Epidemiology um, is, there's not a lot of uh, 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 you know, epidemiological risk factors that are really defined for the, for the tumors in, uh, that we deal with in the oncology side for some of the things that, uh, that I mentioned. Yes? So I was fascinated by your last point that brain metastases tend to be the same genetically and different from metastases elsewhere in the body. So a couple of things occurred to me that I wondered if you would comment on. One possibility is that that second brain metastasis came from the first one. The other possibility is there's something unique about the brain environment that's causing that to be uh, the, the, uh, the, the phenomenon. What, what do you think about that? The question is, why are the brain metastases why is there little divergence, genetic divergence in the brain metastases, whereas there's a wide divergence uh, from the brain and other sites of metastasis in the body? You hit on the two points that uh, I think are, one can speculate. Uh, this is, these are the, I don't have anything beyond those two points, which is maybe they do arise from you know, the same clone of cells there, and they're just trafficking to different parts of the brain, but they're all the same uh, tumor. 
or the other is there's something that there's a genetic constitution that enables some type of neurotropism for these tumors to get into the brain that's different and travel within the brain. Uh, but beyond that, I don't really, I don't know. But it's, uh, and you know, it's a hundred cases. I think this, this is a, it's a, it's a provocative finding, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a, a misread. I think that, you know, there, there are enough cases here to believe that there's a real story. Were there any cases where there was more than two metastases in the same brain? I don't think so, uh, because again, you're not usually resecting right. three metastases. Sometimes you do, but most, most of these. The one that I showed you actually was, they took, they divided into three different specimens. One was a parietal, and they took the cerebellum, and they actually split it to look at the cerebellum, because there was, a, there was kind of a satellite lesion in the cerebellum. But beyond that, I don't think so. I think the autopsy studies will be fascinating, and that's why we're really trying to push forward with the autopsy studies. Yes? So that was a great uh, lecture, uh, Tracy, and I wanted to uh, to thank you for coming and, uh, and delivering this uh, on this special day. I was impressed as uh, in exactly the same way that Tom was, and maybe thinking about it slightly different. Uh, I imagine, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, that a malignancy somewhere in the body is flicking cells constantly off into the bloodstream. They're circulating. Many of them, we hope, are being destroyed by uh, surveillance systems in the immune uh, uh, cell line. Uh, but some of them take hold in different places. Uh, and as they're flicking off and this sick piece of tissue is mutating, I could imagine that uh, a random mutation gives it special uh, priority to be able to survive in my kidney or in my brain. So I'm thinking about it as being especially equipped to seek out a new home in the brain because of X, Y, or Z mutation. Uh, and uh, that's very intriguing. Uh, then what you would find is a certain homogeneous set of mutations from a particular primary in the kidney with a lot of genetic similarity. They're in the kidney because they've got this special genetic bonus uh, to be able to survive there. I'm sure you've thought about that. Your your angle was about treatment, but I'm thinking now about why do they wind up in the brain with this particular problem? Well, I think that was kind of you were making, partially making that point as well. I, I think, no, I think that's a yeah, third, yeah. third hypothesis. I, I guess that's what I was trying to say with this kind of, there's some sort of tropism maybe that's, um, that these cells are endowed with based on their genetics that lead them to the brain. Um, but I, I don't know what it is. And I don't know which you know which which gene pathway or what what it is, but I think that that's certainly um, yet yeah, you know, another possibility. Yes. So I was hoping you could comment on access of these targeted agents to areas in the brain, given the blood-brain barrier and the complexity of sussing out the difficulty getting these things into the tumors, as compared to just discussing the mutations as they're changing. And doing it right. Better. Right. Well, you're, that's a good point because some of the drugs are better equipped uh, to get into the brain than others, and it has to do with molecular weight and polarity and all of these pharmacokinetic properties. For example, I mentioned the EGFR story. Gafitinib um, or lotinib are not, grain, are not great brain-penetrating drugs. Dacamitinib, though, is. So they, these do, they do have different uh, CNS-penetrating properties. Um, but these are pretty much known, so I think as we select these drugs for trials, uh, you know, we, you, we obviously want to understand their, their uh, pharmacology, and I think we select the ones that are, uh, have better ability to traverse a normal blood-brain barrier, because they're all going to get into the contrast-enhancing tumor uh, where the blood-brain barrier is disrupted, but we want drugs that will get beyond that. Uh, for example, in the... Um, uh, craniopharyngioma trial. Uh, Vimorafenib was the first generation BF inhibitor, uh, but they selected Dabrafenib for the trial because Dabrafenib has a little bit better CNS uh, penetration. So, so they're variable, but it's, I think it's known, and you can select from the, the ones that are most likely to get into the brain. And uh, it could also be potentially dose dependent. There's some data on Gafitinib yeah. and a lot of them high doses. Lepatinib. <laughs> Right. We may see, as you said, uh, pharmacokinetics in the future. Uh, 
Yeah. I think that's right. Uh, uh, Machi made the point that these are also, you know, depending on the dose schedule uh, and and um, and uh, how you dose these drugs, also can influence the ability of these drugs to get into the brain. And there's, I think, there's a nice story evolving around lapatinib uh, in that way. Yes. So this is sort of in its infancy compared to some other solid cancers, but there are certain challenges that people recognize with traditional MDA sampling for what you're going to say. This is a mutation you showed in your example of PGFR and CMAP. How much of this sort of thing can be has to be accounted for potentially by intratumoral hydrogenase? One question: How are you going to address that? Is in your paradigm of personalized medicine, and second, you know, in, in non-small cells, sort of the poster child for uh, bypass mechanisms to get around sort of the point mutation. So, so how do you, when you go to target these things using a single targeted agent for anticipating mutations, or I guess in general, how are you going to, do you anticipate the similar story with, as this moves on, of getting <coughs> bypass mechanisms, and how are we going to approach uh, this sort of thing, and what about combination therapy? And lastly, I hate to say, what about the I word? Well, I kept that out. <laughs> so let me let me see. So the question was about, one question was about intratumoral heterogeneity. Uh, the other question was about resistance and bypass mechanisms as these tumors evolve, new muta resistance mutations emerge, etc. Intratumoral heterogeneity is a very real issue. Um, I didn't have time to show it today, but Mario Suva and Brad Bernstein in our place have really been leaders in looking at intratumoral heterogeneity and glioblastoma. Uh, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. They, were, they had a paper in cancer cell, a paper in science. Their cancer cell paper showed that, it, this is an autopsy study, when you look at different regions of uh, where glioblastoma was at the time of uh, autopsy, you had different receptor tyrosine kinases activated in different regions of the same tumor, just with different anatomic regions. About about 5% of the, of the glioblastomas they looked at had that so-called genetic mosaicism. And then they looked using single RNA-seq at transcriptional programs in glioblastoma. And you know, the TCGA would lead us to believe that there are four types of glioblastoma. There's neural, proneural, mesenchymal, classical, right? So uh, what it turns out in the glioblastomas they were sampling and looked at, all four of these transcriptional programs were turned on in many of them in the same tumor. So there's a, a remarkable degree of intratumoral heterogeneity. And it may be that we can't surmount it. Uh, but you know, there are examples though, in, I mean, melanoma and other, others where there is intratumoral heterogeneity and still you get some benefit from these drugs. We're hopeful that'll be the case here. In terms of resistance mechanisms, of course, I mean, they're gonna you know, emerge. Uh, but you know, it, it, for glioblastoma, you know, we, we would take a six month extension of PFS or OS at this point in the where we are in the field and we can deal with resistance down the line. Maybe we find our MEK inhibitor to go with a BRAF inhibitor. So it's going to be a, um, a matter of developing you know, these drugs to target these different pathways. But as you know, the challenge there is the toxicities. You know, these are multi, using multiple TKIs is very, very difficult in these patients. So very good questions. I think these are all things that we're going to have to have to grapple with. Uh, you know, as we, we move ahead in this field. Tracy, one more uh, question, and uh, this is the question uh, that everybody wants to ask you, but uh, they're too dignified to do it. Uh, so uh, maybe five years ago, three years ago, there was a paper in JAMA Neurology uh, about cell phone use and brain tumors. And it was unbelievably intriguing. Uh, the paper got published in a good place. It was reviewed by about seven independent reviewers before it appeared. Uh, one side of the head uh, where you hold your, your phone uh, had a much greater incidence of uh, primary brain tumors than the other uh, across, I don't know, 300,000 people. Uh, has anything more come of that? Do you have a cell phone? <laughs> I do. I try to use a plug-in now and again. Uh, I somebody I know well here. <laughs> what a smart guy. It has nothing to do with this tumor thing, does it? <laughs> well, uh, where is, uh, so I guess 
you know, one of the thing, one of the things that is is hard to get around is biologic plausibility. Can non-ionizing radiation, like the type you get from a, a cell phone or somebody's tower, things can it really damage DNA? And at least when I, the last time I looked at it, there was a lot of skepticism that there was biologic plausibility to this whole notion, right? But the, and then there was the New England Journal paper that was a very well done uh, case control study where they looked at cell phone use and they looked at uh, the incidence of all types of tumors. And the one you think that, that you should get if there's any in truth to this, which is acoustic neuromas, right? Vestibular schwannomas. And there was just flat, you know, odds ratios of 1.0, 1.0, that there really didn't seem to be any, any uh, increased risk with, uh, with cell phones. I don't, I, don't, I don't know the JAMA paper well enough to comment on it, but I think that I, th I thought that that had pretty much been put to rest. I have a call coming in right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you. <laughs> Tracy, thank Great. you okay. so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. We can stay for just 30 seconds. I would like to ask Spence family to uh, present a commemorative plaque to Dr. Spence, Dr. Bachelor, and I would like to also invite Mary Spence for a little recognition. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Photo off here. Don't anyone move. Uh, although I think it'd be better if you stood. Uh, yeah, with the screen off. Uh, yeah. That was very good. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, Better. Thank you.